lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. You are welcome to be seated for the reading of this gospel lesson for today, for it is a very lengthy lesson, and I am just going to include the sermon as a part of the reading of the lesson for today. For those again, you're welcome to take out who are present, you're welcome to take out your sermon handout entitled Lazarus. And today, uh, for those who are watching online, you're welcome again to download this sermon handout on the announcement for today's uh, service on our Facebook page. So, we begin with the story, this great story about Lazarus and the wonderful resuscitation story of a man who was once dead, but now was alive. And I'm not convinced, by the way, that this was such an exciting story, not least, not for Lazarus after all. I mean, can you imagine actually being in the presence of God and seeing God's face and then being wrenched away from that only to be brought back to life? Are you kidding me? Goodness, I'm not sure he was so excited to be brought back to life. My opinion that this was a great exciting thing for him is a silly notion. So we're going to find out why then would Jesus have done this. So let's hear the reading of the lesson for today. A certain man was ill, Lazarus, of Bethany, from the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus is ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And you want to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, so I am going to go and awaken him. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, <laughs> had been speaking. Jesus, however, then therefore, Jesus uh, therefore had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you might believe. Let's therefore go to him. Thomas, one called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. A little dramatic, don't you think? Verse 17. Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. Imagine that. Just stop for a minute. We're stopping out of the lesson. Only two miles away. Jesus could have been there in a half an hour, he and his disciples, when they got the message from Mary and Martha. Half an hour. So Jesus is kind of looking a little bit like a chump right now, as you're going to hear when Mary and Martha come and confront him. So Bethany was so near to Jerusalem, some two miles away, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of life. Those who believe me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. 
So when she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here, he's calling for you. She went and heard it. She got up quickly and went, went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village. It was still the place where Martha had met them. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and went going out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. Stop again from the lesson. Do you notice the difference between Mary and Martha? They said the exact same thing. But Martha ended that phrase with an exclamation of faith that she trusted Jesus. Not so Mar Mary. So Martha said that uh, word of trust. Mary did not. I think Mary is a little upset with Jesus at this point. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews came with her, were also weeping, he was greatly disturbed, and in spirit he was deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Some of them said, could he who not, who opened the eyes, not who opened, who opened the eyes of the blind men, have kept this man from dying? Remember, we've been out of the lesson again. We've been talking about all those who reject Jesus, especially those near his hometown. Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave. The stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me now. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd here, so that they might believe that you have sent me. I'm going to stop just out of this lesson again for a moment. Had Jesus gone and done this miracle that he's about to do, healed him while Lazarus was still ill, how many people would have believed it? Oh, he was just going to get better anyway. Remember, if you were listening to the sermon last week, I told the story about the man cured of cancer, went into remission for 10 years and then died 10 years later of something completely different, you'd think that would be a spectacular thing. But people always try to find a reason for that that's beyond and above the supernatural. In fact, I had one of the people come to me and say, well, that could have just been whatever. That happens on occasion. And so we discredit God for the miracle. Well, there's no doubt that this man ain't coming back from the dead. And I'll tell you, there is a reason why four days was mentioned. Because if Jesus had resuscitated him within three days, everybody would say, oh, he probably wasn't really dead. But these words are left here for us to give us the impression that, yes, he was truly, really, really dead. You know, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Is he dead? No, he's really, really dead. Because he's beyond the point of being able to be resuscitated. Four days. Oh, and by the way, it stinks in there. So we know this man is truly dead. There's no question. Now, with what's about to happen, it is a miracle. So what happens? When Jesus had said these words, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, and his hands and his feet were bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Wow. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless us as with this word today, we thank you for this beautiful lesson of Lazarus and pray that you inspire us. Use the words of my mouth, the meditation of those present hearts 
that they might all be acceptable in our, your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. We take a moment to turn to the handout for today again, as I mentioned to you. A little shorter lesson because the reading itself is very lengthy. I want to get straight to the meat and the heart of this lesson. And we want to talk about death and people of faith. Death and people of faith. How do we face death? I will confess to you as I get older, I get a little more nervous about these things. And people say, well, you're a pastor. You should have faith. Well, you can have faith and still be nervous about things, right? That is not a contradiction. It doesn't mean I don't trust Jesus. It just means we fear what is going to come on the other side. But we Christians believe that death is not the final word. For we believe that even in death, there is opportunity for life. Now we know this biologically. We know that this is true. We've seen this take place every day. Every time something dies... Something uses that death as its fuel, right? A forest dies with a fire that, that now lays the conditions for something brand new. An animal dies so that somebody might live, right? This is why we give thanks when we partake of our meal. Something gave its life for us. We had no right to take this life, but God granted us the privilege of being able to take this life so that we might live. Remember, that ground beef that you eat was a cow, and that cow is precious to God. We need to say thank you, for this cow gave its life for us. So we are used to this idea that in death there's opportunity for life. It's a biological reality. Therefore, it's not absurd necessarily to believe that our deaths will bring some type of life. But what type of life will it be? I don't know. Lazarus caught a glimpse of what was on the other side. That's why I say he saw the face of God. He was in the presence of God. Who would want to come back from that? Why would it be happy for him to return? Worse still... Lazarus is only being resuscitated. He wasn't resurrected. I really don't like the use of that word, resurrection in this case, because when you are resurrected, you don't ever die again. That's a theological concept. So he was not resurrected. This man had to face death a second time. Who would want to go through that twice? Are you kidding me? That's crazy. Death wasn't easy for him the first time around. He suffered and lingered for days with whatever illness he had. His second death, it could be worse. It really could. So the resuscitation of Lazarus was not a kind gift for Lazarus or to Lazarus. However, do you know who truly benefited from this? Oh, Mary and Martha. And I'm sure once Lazarus realized that, sounds like he was a loving man. He was a beloved disciple of Jesus. Not one of the twelve, but still a beloved disciple whose life and heart was changed by Jesus. He would look at with great compassion upon his sisters. If he had been in the face and the presence of God, he would know the type of compassion and love that God would have had for Mary and Martha. He would be willing to face that again for them. You see, their situation was less secure. There was no place and no role for women who were not married. By all intents and purposes, what we can gather, Mary and Martha weren't married. Don't know why, but they weren't. They had no kids, no indication of that. They had very little social standing. So their parents were gone, and Lazarus, therefore, was their provider. And this is the reason why Jesus wept. Jesus knew what was about to take place, didn't he? But he saw the heartache of his people whom he loves. I am sure every single day where we suffer through some heartache or we lose a loved one or we're going through some challenges, Jesus weeps with us. We should not be all Pollyanna about this life. Oh, everything's going to turn out okay. 
Jesus was in this suffering with Mary and Martha. It was only another few minutes. He knew at the end of this, there would be this resuscitation and things would kind of be okay for them. But he saw their heartache as temporary as it was from his perspective and he wept for them. So if you're going through a hard time, it's okay to cry and weep. And we have a promise that we have a Savior who will weep with us. That's why that verse is so powerful. There is another reason why Lazarus was brought back from the dead. Certainly, I think, most importantly for Mary and Martha. But we hear of this right at the beginning of the lesson. This was to reveal the glory of God. To demonstrate God's power over death. In case anybody questioned, you see, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, see, he never died again after that, a lot of people disparaged that and said, oh, come on. Somebody just hid the body. That's, of course, a theory to this day. They just hid the body somewhere. He was still dead. Or he never really died. This story proves that Jesus has the power over death and life so that we get the news of his truth, of his resurrection, we will believe it. Jesus, when talking with Martha, remember, doesn't say that he will be, at some future day, the resurrection of the life. What does he say? I am, this very moment, right now today, even though I'm going to go and face death itself, and I am going to die, I'm still the resurrection of the life. He is now at this very moment. Now, they could be just meaningless words, couldn't they? Like the most of the things that we say at funerals. Oh, it'll be okay, honey. Oh, you know, he's, he's okay. He's in heaven now. Well, you know, we should celebrate. We say some of the dumbest things, don't we, at funerals? You're going to be okay. Really? You've just had the love of your life ripped from you? And you're sitting here telling them they're going to be okay? What did Jesus do? He sat down and wept. Maybe we need to take that advice when we go to funerals and stop saying these silly words that we say. Just grab people, hug them, and weep. Just weep. Jesus follows up his words, though, with action. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, it's because he is the resurrection and the life. And with those simple words, Lazarus, come forth. His life is restored, temporarily. But his life was restored. Oh, this lesson is so rich for us, isn't it? It's a reminder to us that God never abandons us. When we are caught in our despair, Jesus sits in our presence and weeps with us. You might feel alone, you're not. We are never alone. And we know that there is life that transcends the boundaries of this physical universe because of the promise of what Jesus Christ has done. That God is good and kind, and gracious, and merciful, and loving. So you may feel like you're struggling against a, a mountain of pain right now. You don't battle this alone. You don't have to go by yourself. We've got a Lord who walks with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful lesson about Lazarus and pray that you would bless us with your presence this day. For we know that many who are listening are suffering and struggling with a mountain of, of heartaches and, and pains. So we pray that you would walk with them, sit with them amidst their, their sorrows and weep with them, God, and lift them up and help them to take that next step forward in faith. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to sing the song of the day with me. We're going to do this online here. How fantastic is that? So I invite you to turn to hymn number 669. Rise up, O saints of God.
Let us stand. God bless the meal that you're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen.